monsters really do exist. Of that I am certain. Now, I'm not talking about vampires, werewolves, or zombies. All the kind that hide in your closet or under your bed. No, sir. I'm talking about monsters that can disguise themselves in any form they choose, and blend in so well, you don't even know they're there. But these monsters aren't out to kill and destroy. Oh, no. They're too clever for that. They would much rather play games, and always seem to know what your next move will be should you challenge them. These are creatures of superior intelligence with the cunning of serpents and the ability to camouflage themselves like chameleons. They are as elusive as butterflies, slippier than eels, and will stalk you like a leopard in the dark. They will shadow you during the day and haunt your dreams at night. They will leave a trail of breadcrumbs for you to follow, then lure you into their traps just for amusement. They are playful, and will make you do awful things as you attempt to expose them. I will never forget the first day I saw Amanda on the number 9 bus. I'd overslept and had to scramble around just to catch the bus on time for work. Outside. It was pouring down with rain, and it was foggy. I ran across the street and made it to the bus stop just as the eight o'clock bus was pulling up to the curb. It was jam-packed with college students and people commuting to work. There was barely enough room to breathe. I managed to find an empty seat by the window about halfway down the aisle. A spiffy-looking businessman carrying a briefcase sat down beside me and nodded politely. In the seat in front of him, there was an elderly woman with a walker that was partially blocking the aisle. And seated by the window directly in front of me, I noticed an attractive young girl with long, dark hair. She wore tight-fitting jeans, a long raincoat and knee-high boots. She was probably in her early twenties, and most likely a college student. I recognized most of the people on the bus as regular passengers, but I couldn't recall ever seeing her before, and I'm sure I would have noticed. Inside the bus, the windows were all steamed up, so I cleared a spot with my sleeve where I could look out at the buildings passing by. The businessman started to cough and fidget, so I pulled out my paperback and pretended to read. Five minutes later, the bus pulled up in front of the college. The girl in front of me stood up and nudged her way toward the rear exit. She was exceptionally pretty. She must have sensed that I was staring because she flashed me a friendly smile as she went by. Knowing that I'd been caught, I turned around to look out the window when I noticed something was written on the glass right by the spot I cleared. It read... Hi, Billy. Billy is my name, but I certainly didn't write it. And I think I would have seen whoever did, because I never left my seat. I was puzzled, intrigued, and a little bit disturbed. It was then I realized that it must have been the college girl. Somehow she must have scrawled my name on the glass with her finger when I wasn't paying attention. But how was that even possible? I would have seen her. I looked out of the window to see if I could spot her, and there she was, just standing there under her umbrella, smiling up at me. I jerked back instinctively as the bus pulled away. The businessman gave me a dirty look and moved to another seat. I was really uneasy and didn't know what to do. Should I get off the bus and confront her, or just continue on my way and pretend like nothing happened? I casually wiped the writing off the window, waited until the bus stopped a few blocks from college, and hopped off. I hurried back up the hill through the pouring rain, and hid in the small cafe across the street. Visibly shaken and soaking wet, I ordered a cup of coffee and sat down on the stool by the window. 
There was a group of college kids hanging around outside, but by this time most of the students were already in class. I sat there for about half an hour, nervously sipping my coffee, just hoping that I might catch another glimpse of the mysterious girl from the bus. I was already late for work, so I called my boss to tell him I wouldn't be coming in. I gathered up my things, left the cafe, and walked to the corner to catch the bus home. I had the following day off, but I caught the eight o'clock bus going downtown anyway. It wasn't nearly as packed as it had been the previous day, and this time I found an empty seat in the rear of the bus. As I walked down the aisle, I spotted the mysterious college girl in the corner of my eye. She was sitting all alone in the middle of the bus. She glanced up and smiled coquettishly as I passed by which gave me a chill. We again made eye contact and my heart started pounding faster. She was absolutely breathtaking. I finally reached the back of the bus and sat down nervously. A few minutes later, the bus pulled up in front of the college and the kids started filing off. The mysterious girl stood up, paused a moment, then looked directly at me and smiled again, as if she knew exactly where I'd be sitting. When I peered out the window to see which way she was going, she suddenly turned around and waved at me just as the bus drove away. I immediately rang the buzzer to signal I wanted off at the next stop. I trotted back up the hill to the college. This time there were lots of kids milling around, but the mysterious girl was nowhere to be seen. I dashed across the street and ducked into the cafe for another cup of coffee. I sat down and just stared out the window for about 20 minutes, but still didn't see any sign of her. It was as though she'd simply vanished into thin air. I was just about ready to give up when a couple of college kids came walking in. I recognized them right away from the bus. I waited until they got their drinks and sat down. They started joking around with each other and kept glancing over in my direction. I finished the last of my coffee and got up to leave. As I walked by their table, one of them turned to me and said, What's up, dude? Hey, you ride that dreaded morning bus too, don't you? Oh, yeah. I see you guys on there all the time. What's going on? I asked. Eh, nothing much, really, the other one said. Just grabbing some coffee before class. What? You on your way to work or something? <laughs> no, not today, I answered. It's my day off. Say, uh, maybe you guys can help me out, I inquired. I thought I recognized someone on the bus this morning. Maybe you guys know who she is. <laughs> I don't know, dude. Who is she? The first one said, and they both started to chuckle. I don't know her name or nothing, but she has long brown hair and was sitting in the middle of the bus. I explained. They looked at each other and thought about it for a moment. <sighs> I don't know, bro. It could be Becky, but she don't ride the bus much anymore. Where do you say you knew her from again? He asked suspiciously. Uh, she used to be an old neighbor of mine, I lied. I think she lived a few houses down from me. Just then, the other kid interrupted. Ah, oh, you mean that weird sophomore chick that always rides the bus by herself. What's her name? Amanda or something. Oh yeah, her, his friend confirmed. Yeesh, she's definitely a strange one. I don't think she has any friends. Well, listen, man, the second one said. We really gotta get going or we'll be late for class. It was nice talking to you and uh, good luck. <laughs> See you later, the other one said, and they got up to leave. Thanks, guys. See you around. Amanda, huh? I had a difficult time getting to sleep that night, but Saturday morning I woke up refreshed and ready to take on the day. I wondered if the mysterious college girl lived close by. 
She didn't look familiar, and her name didn't ring a bell. Yet somehow she knew who I was. How else could she have known my name? I wondered what else she knew about me. I called my mum to tell her I'd be dropping by after lunch and left the apartment. It was a pleasant day for a change, so I caught an uptown bus to the mall and strolled about the shops for a while, just to see if the mysterious college girl happened to be out and about. I wandered the streets for a good hour or more, but didn't see her around anywhere. So, I stopped in one of my favourite restaurants for a bite to eat, then hopped a cross-town bus to drop by on my mother for a short visit. It had been a few weeks since I'd seen her. When I arrived at my old house, my mother greeted me with a big hug, and we sat down and chatted over a fresh pot of coffee. We talked about the usual stuff, my work, my social life, that sort of thing. As I was getting ready to go, my mom asked if I had a new girlfriend. I told her that I didn't, and she said, huh, That's funny. Are you sure? Because a very polite young lady by the name of Amanda just called before you got here and asked me if you were on your way. Oh, she sounded very sweet. I tried my hardest to stay calm and pretended as if I'd never heard of her before. Uh, did you tell her I was on my way over? I asked. Yes, of course. She said she'd call you later. Is everything all right, dear? You seem troubled. Yeah, yes, Mum. Everything is fine, I reassured her. She sounded quite young, Billy. How old is this new girlfriend of yours, anyway? Yeesh, I don't know, Mum. I told you, she's not my girlfriend. I'd better be going now. I'll call you in a couple of days, okay? Sure, honey. She gave me a big hug and kiss, and I rushed out the door, anxious to get home before Amanda called. When I got back to the apartment, I noticed that somebody had called and left a message. I turned on the answering machine. The voice on the recording sounded creepy and slightly distorted. It was that of a young girl, and this is what she said. Hello, Billy. This is your new girlfriend, Amanda. Sorry we missed each other at the mall today, but don't worry. I'll be there waiting for you tomorrow. See you then. <laughs> I heard childish laughter, followed by a busy signal and a dial tone. And then the phone went dead. I checked the caller ID, but the number was unavailable. I yanked the cord from the wall in frustration and fell back in my easy chair. How the hell did she know I was at the mall too? She must have followed me from the moment I left my apartment. For all I knew, she was still watching me. I slowly walked over to the window, parted the curtains and looked down over the busy intersection. Could she be hiding in plain sight? I was growing weary of this game of cat and mouse. In fact, I wasn't even sure who was the cat and who was the mouse anymore. On Sunday morning, I hopped the uptown bus and got to the mall, just as they were opening the doors. There was a line of shoppers waiting to get in. I took the escalator to the upper level and found an empty table in the food court, where I could sit down and drink my coffee. I watched the people coming and going as I waited nervously for Amanda to find me. I carefully scanned the pavilion to see if I could spot her spying on me and catch her at her own game. Almost an hour passed, and I still didn't see any sign of her. I started to wonder if I'd been stood up. I opened my paper back and began reading. A few minutes had hardly gone by when I heard the click-clack of boot heels approaching from behind. I spun around in my chair, and there she stood, just smiling down at me seductively. I was stunned. She was easily the most beautiful girl I'd ever laid eyes on. She wore skinny jeans, a tight t-shirt, and her raincoat was unbuttoned, revealing a full, 
curvy, voluptuous figure. Her legs were long and slender. Mind if I sit down? She asked in a soft, sultry voice. No, of course not. Please do, I said, gesturing to the chair across from me. I was completely mesmerized by her charms. Her long, chestnut-colored hair was silky and smooth. She wore a pair of dazzling diamond-studded earrings, and her deep blue eyes were positively dreamy. They were the color of midnight, and they seemed to pull me in as if I were falling under some kind of seductive spell. <laughs> like what you see, Billy. She said flirtatiously. You know, if you play your cards right, you might get to see even more of me later. I was speechless. What's the matter? Cat got your tongue. She held my gaze with those big hypnotic eyes. I tried to look away, but I simply could not take my eyes off of her. Finally, I said, what do you want from me? I mean, why are you so interested in me? I don't even know you. Oh, but I think you do. After all, I know you, don't I, Billy? She said sarcastically. I was dumbfounded. How do you know my name? <laughs> that was easy. She replied. Why have you been following me around? You don't know anything about me. She leaned forward and said with a mysterious smile. Oh, but that's where you're wrong, Billy. I know everything about you. Oh yeah? Like what? We've never even met before. I know you like pretty girls. How the hell did you get my mother's number anyway? I demanded to know. The same way I got yours. In the phone book, of course. She said nonchalantly. <laughs> what do you want from me? I asked again. You have no business following me around. Don't you have a boyfriend? <laughs> Why? Are you interested? She paused for a second. We could go out on a date sometime. I'll bet you'd like that, wouldn't you, Billy? She replied playfully. I want to know why you are so interested in me. <laughs> it's really quite simple, she said, biting down on her lip. I've always found men to be shallow, ignorant little twits. They are dull, self-centered, and usually quite obnoxious. But you, Billy, are the exact opposite. You are extremely intelligent, very inquisitive, and you have a certain air of confidence about you, which I find irresistibly attractive. <laughs> I'm flattered, I really am. I'm just not used to being stalked by pretty girls. I'm sure you understand, I said. With that, she stood up unexpectedly and said, I'm sorry, you'll have to excuse me, but I really must be going now. She reached into her handbag, pulled out an envelope, and set it down on the table in front of me. I sure hope you'll come by to see more of me later. I'll be waiting for you. You won't be disappointed. I promise. She flashed one last provocative smile before turning to leave. I watched her casually walk away. I immediately tore open the envelope, nearly ripping the letter inside. I unfolded the letter and read the address. 444 Devereux Hill Drive. I knew the area well. Devereux Hill was located in Cardinal Crest right off Davenport Road on the outskirts of town, roughly twenty miles from the mall. I stuffed the letter in my pocket and looked around. 
It was only 11.15 and the food court was already packed with hungry shoppers. Now it was my turn to follow her for a change. I stood up abruptly, nearly tipping over my chair, and bolted across the crowded pavilion. I was only 30 seconds behind her. Everybody turned to gawk in astonishment as I practically flew down the escalator and sprinted through the lobby toward the exit. I pushed hard on the door and stepped outside to see if I could spot her, but once again she had simply vanished. It was then I noticed a couple of security guards eyeing me suspiciously, so I lit a cigarette and walked leisurely back to the bus stop. When I got back to the apartment I called my mother to ask her if I could borrow the car for a few hours. I told her I had a date with a cute girl from the college. She asked me if it was the same one who called looking for me the other day. I explained that it wasn't, and said her name was Becky or Brenda or something, and that we had just met at the mall. She readily agreed. When I arrived at my mum's place around six o'clock, she was waiting for me on the front porch. She handed me the keys and said, Have a good time, dear. Drive safe and have the car back home by midnight, please. The old Ford wagon started right up, so I drove into town and filled up the tank just in case. I took the main drag out of town and turned left onto Davenport Road, heading east toward Cardinal Crest. I drove by farmhouses, rolling pastures, dense woods, and miles and miles of cornfields. By the time I got to Devereux Hill, it was already getting dark but the old Fairmont climbed the steep incline with ease. I cruised past the historical society and old cemetery. From the top of the hill I could barely make out the dark silhouettes of the headstones and museum looming in the headlights. Her house was at the top of Devereux Hill. I did a quick drive-by of the place. It was a large, two-story Victorian brownstone mansion. The house was dark and mysterious, except for a single light that shone through one of the second-story windows. I switched off my headlights, pulled into the church parking lot about half a mile away, and shut off the engine. I locked the wagon, pocketed the keys, and hiked back up the hill toward her house. The old iron gates leading down the long driveway were wide open, so I stopped to take a good look around. I've always had a morbid fascination for the macabre, but this place was downright spooky. It literally gave me goosebumps. I felt uneasy and apprehensive, and wondered if I should go through with it or not. I even considered just turning around and going back home, but in the end my infatuation for Amanda got the better of me. I pulled the hoodie up over my head and started creeping cautiously down the driveway. Everything was silent and still, except for the old weather vane and the giant oak trees creaking in the wind, and the occasional passing car. The front lawn was scraggly and looked as though it hadn't been mowed in months. There was an old forgotten flower garden with a run-down gazebo, that was in need of a fresh coat of paint. When I finally reached the steps leading to the front porch, I was greeted by a pair of giant stone griffins staring down at me with menacing expressions. The big front door was constructed of thick, heavy wood, and the red paint was chipped and faded. There was a brass lion's head door knocker, which looked as though it had recently been polished. I decided I'd better have a look around out back before I announced my arrival, just to make sure there were no hidden dangers lurking in the shadows. There were more oak trees, and the tall grass was overrun with daisies and violets. I could hear the sound of wind chimes tinkling gently in the breeze. Over beyond the embankment, near the edge of the property, by a dense patch of woods, 
I noticed what appeared to be an old, dilapidated servants' quarters covered with ivy. And in the middle of the lawn stood an old bronze sundial, with life-size statue of a raven perched precariously on the tip of the pointer. I snuck around the back of the house and slithered up the other side, until I again found myself face to face with the winged griffins. But this time the door was propped wide open as if somebody were trying to entice me inside. I slowly crept up the crumbling concrete steps and hesitated. Inside, the house was pitch black and silent. Taking a deep breath, I crossed the threshold and entered the gloomy mansion. It smelled damp and musty. I gradually inched forward, into the darkness, the floorboards creaking and cracking under my weight. Without warning, a violent gust of wind came swirling out of nowhere and whipped through the vestibule, slamming the big front door shut with a loud thump. Startled, I jumped back with fright and stumbled into something very large and heavy. It was an antique grandfather clock. But it wasn't just any old grandfather clock. It was the same one my grandparents had before they passed away. I recognized it from my childhood when we would go and visit them at the farm up on Bluebird Lane. Every detail was exactly the way I remembered. From the clockmaker's signature to the patterns in the wood, to the familiar rhythmic ticking sound the pendulum made as it swung back and forth, right down to the scratches in the walnuts, chip in the crown, and the cracked faceplate from the time I accidentally tipped it over when I was nine or ten. I stretched out a hand to steady the swaying timepiece before it could come crashing down on top of me. I found a light switch on the wall and flipped it on. A chandelier lit up, dimly illuminating the room in a pale glow. At the far end of the hallway was a parlour, with a long flight of stairs twisting its way up past the balcony to the second floor. On one side of the staircase was a beautiful old Steinway, and on the other, a magnificent marble labyrinth. I fumbled over to the foot of the stairs and hollered. Hello? Is anyone home? Amanda, are you up there? It's me, Billy. Nothing. The house? was perfectly still. I called out her name again. Are you here, Amanda? It's me, Billy. I know you're up there. Not a sound. Just the tick-tock of the old grandfather clock. I'd had just about enough of her charades. I was determined to put an end to this game of hide-and-seek once and for all, and charged up the stairs. The second floor was dark too, except for a faint, flickering shaft of light leaking out from under the crack of one of the doors at the end of the long hallway. I crept quietly down the hall. I leaned forward, put my ear against the door and listened. Soft music was playing inside the room. It sounded scratchy, like an old phonograph record. I knocked on the door and called her name one more time. Amanda, open up. I know you're in there. I tried turning the doorknob, but the room was locked. Suddenly the music stopped playing and the room got eerily quiet. Amanda, are you in there? Open the door, I shouted. Then... I heard her soft, sultry voice whisper and say, Welcome, Billy. Won't you come in? I rattled the handle again, but the door wouldn't budge. Now my blood was really pumping. Exasperated, I slammed into the door with all my weight, splintering the frame to pieces. The door flung open, spilling shards of light into the narrow hall. I burst into the room. 
The two college kids boarded the number 9 bus at 7.55am. As usual, it was packed full of commuters on their way to work. But they managed to find a couple of seats in the back of the bus. Hey dude, check it out, one said, gesturing toward the middle seats. There's that weird chick from English Lit. You know, the one that dude at the coffee shop was talking about. <laughs> oh yeah, I hadn't seen her in a while. I wonder where she's been hiding lately, the other one said. I don't know, man, but she sure is smoking hot. No kidding. Come to think of it, I ain't seen that dude around lately either. Maybe he got a new job or something, the first one surmised. Yeah, you're probably right. He paused for a second and then said, Hey, speaking of smoking hot, did you hear about that big fire up on Devereux Hill over the weekend? He asked. Yep, I saw something about it on the news, the first one confirmed. I guess one of them spooky old mansions by the museum went up in flames in the middle of the night. Evidently, they pulled some guy out alive just before it burned to the ground. They said it started in one of the upstairs bedrooms or something. Oh, get this. They think it might have been intentionally set. So there you go, my dear friends. Full of mystery and intrigue for your Monday evening pleasure. <laughs> nice story, that one. Really enjoyed it. Um, leaves a lot of questions to be answered, and I hope you're going to give me your theories in the comment section below. Well, that's all for me for this evening, but I am fully back on my regular schedule, so guess what? I'll be with you again on Wednesday and again on Friday, so I do so hope you'll join me. Until then... Good night, my dear friends, and sweet, sweet dreams.